Hello, and welcome to Know Before You Go for Sunday of the second week in Advent. I'm Brother Joe Trout, and I'd like to start with one very simple question for you. Why are you a Christian? Why are you a part of a people who is looking forward to the birth of Christ? Right? Well, one simple answer is we're, we're longing for a Savior. We want to be saved. But our readings this weekend call us to think much, much more deeply about what that idea of salvation really is. What, what is it that has brought us to this point? Okay? So let me start with the Gospel and work my way backwards. Because in the Gospel we get this proclamation of John the Baptist that he is preparing the way for the Lord. And he prepares the way for the Lord by calling people to repentance. That salvation has something to do with the fact that the world is horribly broken. And scripture reveals to us that the brokenness of the world is very much our fault. Now, that's not actually an intuitively obvious thing. Right? We're so used to that idea as Christians that, uh, that we don't think much about it. But in fact, there's no obvious explanation that it had to be humans who messed it all up. Humanity could have just come into existence in a world that was a mix of good and evil, and we're just kind of trapped by it. But it's specifically the book of Genesis all throughout the Old Testament that we get, no, 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 it's our fault. We contributed to this. And if we want to be saved, we have to turn away from the things that we really have chosen. That in each and every one of our lives, we have chosen the wrong things. We've pursued lesser goods in place of the one who is good. So salvation begins in turning away from something. But that is just the beginning. Right? What does John say? I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of the sandals of the one coming after him. That he baptizes with water, but there is something so much greater coming. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. That in turning away from what's bad, we will enter into a life that is unimaginably bigger than what we experience now. Right? What is that? What are we talking about? Well, one aspect of it we might think of as life after death this promise of entering into rest with God, into paradise. That's true. That's absolutely a Christian hope. It's also what the second reading calls us to, this hope that one day the heavens and the earth will be made new, and that all of the sin of the world will be erased, and we will come to live in a brand new creation, where there's no sin, there is no injustice, there's probably no HR, there's probably no other... Uh, kind of annoying bureaucracy that we deal with in life, is that all things would be well. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very difficult time imagining that because my only experience of this world is a lot of broken things. But to think of relationships that don't pass away, to think of goodness that endures, to think of a day that lasts, and not a day that is over before you've even left work and it's already dark and cloudy before you walk out of the office, right? The lasting goodness. For this we long, and for this we are desperately looking. And we're also pretty frustrated because Jesus promised he was going to come again soon, and for him one day is like a thousand years, and it seems like it may never come. And it is profoundly difficult to hold on to that hope, and yet it will come like a thief in the night that our salvation entails this, this utter conviction that one day all things will in fact be well, and we cannot let go of that. Right? However, in holding to this, Christians have also sometimes given in to the temptation of escapism. That, well, you know, this life might suck, but at least I'll die and go to heaven. Oh. There's some truth in that. Uh, we will deal with lots of suffering. We follow a, you know, we follow a Savior who died on a cross. But that, that can't be everything. That can't be the whole story. Right? Because then what, what is the point of the Christian life? For example, we do believe that people outside of Christianity can be saved. We believe that you know, the goodwill of non-believers, in as much as they have responded to God in their life and how God has interacted with them, they too can enter into eternal life. Uh, Pope Pius XII rejected in the you know, early 20th century the notion that the unbaptized cannot possibly go to heaven. Right? We do believe that other people can inherit the Spirit. 
So why bother now, right? Why bother uh, following after Christ and living, uh, you know, this difficult Christian life when anyone could potentially be in heaven? Well, to our first reading, what does Isaiah say? Comfort. Give comfort to my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end. This is not just about the future. Christ is coming right here and right now. It's, salvation is something that is happening right here and right now in this very moment. Again, this is not always such an easy thing to believe because there's a lot wrong in our lives. Whether that's family members that are feuding and you're worried at Christmas, how are we ever going to actually celebrate together when so-and-so won't talk to so-and-so and it's all going to be miserable. Right? There's a lot of reasons to doubt that our expiation is at hand, that we in fact are no longer you know, trapped by sin and death. It's really difficult to trust this. But this is what a lot of the story of Christianity is about. What do miracles remind us of? The fact that God is present in this world. And, and sometimes he does it in very strange kind of medical healings and a number of other things. But there's way more common ways that God is at work. For example, I can think of many different moments in my life when I sat down in a chapel and said, God, I am exhausted. I cannot do this. I am worn out. I am tired and I'm angry. I a lot of days when I began the day with, Lord, I am just so angry and I don't want to be angry today. And kind of unexpectedly, a peace has come and I've been a better version of myself. There are plenty of moments in life that people can point to when they felt utterly utterly alone, and yet God was there. And these are crucial elements of the Christian life, that in the midst of our misery and agony, we are not alone. And the saints testify to this over and over and over and over again, that they have experienced a sort of consolation by God in the most startling moments. Scripture is full of stories like this. Hannah, who was uh, desperately longing for a child and prays bitterly, weeping and crying, and God grants her a son, Samuel. Esther, who is terrified for her people, and God answers, responds. And there are so many ways that God is regularly breaking into our lives, and not just the grand ways, but those little moments of a friendship that says, all of our life is filled with comfort. Okay? This is the hope that martyrs have. This is the hope that someone who is suffering unjustly has, that you can bear the burdens of our guilt, that each and every one of us can find God now. So why be a Christian? What is this salvation all about? It's about everything. It's about every single moment of history is being filled with the Spirit of God, the past, the present, and the future, the sin that we turn away from, the hope of a resurrection that we look towards, in the very moments of this life, while sin and death are still here, that they don't get the last word, that we can be comforted. So as we look towards Christmas, take time to ponder, how are you becoming healthier in your relationship with God? So that's what salvation comes from. The root word salus means health. How are you becoming whole? Where is God breaking into your life where are you turning away from sin? And where are you finding Christ alive right now, right here? Because he is absolutely with us in the darkest of moments. He is here like a shepherd carrying us as his flock. Trust in him. Have a wonderful Advent and God bless.